week was a really interesting week. We had a lot of different elements uh, to kind of cover. So I did a mini message, and it was really the intro for today. Hopefully you were here last week. If not, I'm going to kind of ease into this today. But we're talking about taming the tongue, about how uh, James in particular, in James chapter 3, we're going to look at some of today, James really gives us these warnings about the, the destruction and damage that our tongues can to, do. So uh, our title for today is Taming the Tongue, Four Warnings, Part 1. Now what does that mean, Four Warnings, Part 1? It means we're not going to have enough time to get through all four. So we're going to cover two of the warnings today, uh, and then in two weeks uh, I will be back. Pastor Pete's going to preach next week. Uh, I'm going as, as soon as we finish here. We are flying out of here and we're going on vacation. I'll be here next Sunday, uh, but I won't, I'm going to take the week off from preaching. So, all right. So, four warnings, part one. So, we have a key statement. And our key statement here is basically, if there's one thing that you have to remember or should remember from today, it's the key statement. If you throw everything else out the window, if, if you just, you know, you fall asleep, that's great. I'm going to give it to you in the beginning and the end, and then you're going to have like 30 minutes to nap really nice, okay? So at the end afterwards, if I walk up, hey, what was the key statement? And you tell me, I'm, I'm not going to know that you were sleeping. So anyway, here's the key statement. Tame your tongue or inhibit what's important. Tame your tongue. Get control of your tongue. Watch what you say. Be careful of what comes out of your mouth. Because if you don't, you will inhibit, which means to, to stop, to slow down, to stop progression of. You will inhibit what's important. And see, every single one of us, every day in life, we want and we go for what's important to us. I guarantee you, if I opened your checkbook, not that anybody actually keeps a checkbook anymore, but if I looked at your bank statement, which would be weird if I did, but if I did, I would be able to tell you what is important. Those things in life that we kind of focus on and move towards, those are the things that are important to us. And if we don't tame our tongue, I still have a click track going in my ear, so let me turn that off. If we don't tame our tongues, if we are not careful about the things that we say, whatever we think is important to us and whatever we're striving after, we will inhibit, slow, or stop those things because our tongues can get us in that much trouble. Tame your tongue or inhibit What's important? So last week, we talked about saying the exact wrong thing at the exact wrong time. And here were some examples um, that I gave you. So, you know, you say something hurtful to someone you love. Uh, you use unchurchy words during a moment of anger, stress, or surprise. Um, you feel like you have to be the dispenser of any and all information. Um, here's, here's one that I thought of this week I didn't give last week. <clears throat> this is a big one. This is a big one, and, and I'll just be honest, I kind of struggle with this one at times. You're talking to somebody, and something's really important to them, and they start telling you a story. And this story, like it's something that happened, and man, I, was, I went to this place, and I saw this person, and they're going into all of these details, and you, you kind of maybe know where the story is going, and you think of a story. And from that moment on, you could give a rip about their story. You know what you're looking for? You're looking for the first second that they stop talking so you can tell your story. And see, that is our hearts. That is something inside of us that's like, no, no, no. What I have to say is more important. What, what I have to say is more relevant. It's more interesting. You're going to like my story better than your story. So we just blah, we give no thought to their story or what they're saying or what's important to them because there's something inside of us, and we'll talk about this in future weeks, there's something inside of us that has to get that out there. There's a lack inside of us. 
So here's another thing we always do. We are always one-upping people. Uh, maybe we know these people, if their lips are moving, they're probably talking about somebody else. We know those people. And then we said last week, we also have, the, here's the churchy one, the incessant intercessor. That means it's a person, oh, we got to pray for Susie. Oh, she's, she's in big trouble. I can't, let, let me tell you what she did. We have to pray for her. No, you're just gossiping and you're wrapping this little blanket of prayer around it to make it like you're not gossiping, but you're just sharing information about people. Where does that come from? Why do we do that? Why do some of words come out of our mouths and we're like, oh, I can't believe I said that. Where did that come from? And Jesus would say, that came directly from your heart. And, and, and you would say, no, 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 no. See, that's not really how I feel. And Jesus would say, yes, that's exactly how you feel in your heart. And we scratched the surface last week about we build up these filters inside of us. And we, we, some of us, man, we have really, really great, sophisticated filters. And most of the time, we are able to keep that junk from coming up out of our hearts and out of our mouths. Most of the time, we're pretty good about it. Ooh, ooh, nope, 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 I'm not going to say it. I'm thinking it, but I'm not going to say it, right? And then every once in a while, something just kind of wiggles right through that filter, and it's like... Blah. And, and, and a lot of the times when we say it, we, we, we try to grab the words as they're coming out of our mouth and pull them back. But guess what? It's too late, isn't it? Where does that come from? It comes from our hearts. And we read these two verses in Luke chapter 6, verses 44 and 45. Jesus says, each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And then Jesus just finishes it off. In case you don't get what I'm saying, Jesus would say, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So those things that you think just slip out of your mouth, that was an accident, I didn't mean to say that. Jesus is saying right here in these verses and other places as well. Matthew chapter 12, I think, is another reference to that. It's all down inside of our hearts. It's what's inside of us, and it's making its way out of our mouths. So hopefully over these next few weeks, we're going to find out why we do those things, and how to stop. Today and this uh, two weeks from today, we're going to look at how damaging it can be. The four warnings that we're going to look at about our tongues. Now James, as we already kind of referred to, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he has a lot to say about the tongue. In, in chapter 1, verse 19, I love this verse. If you've got your Bible, you can turn to James it's right after Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation, the end. So it's almost all the way at the end of the Bible. James, the half-brother of Jesus, we're going to talk about him in a second. As you're flipping there, I'll read this verse, James 1.19. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. So he's stressing, hey guys, this is important. Take note of this. I'm not just talking because I like to hear myself talk. Take note of this. Everyone, which in the Greek means everyone, should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now, when you were growing up, you probably heard from your parents or maybe your grandparents a saying that probably came from this verse. What is it? You've got what? Yep, and two ears. You've got one mouth, and you've got two ears. You should listen twice as much, if not more, than you actually speak. Man, that advice would do some of us really, really well, wouldn't it? I won't give you much time, but can you think of a time in your life where you went, man, if I would have just kept my mouth shut, 
it would have changed everything. I bet you we could spend the rest of the day and go around the room and tell stories about how our mouths have gotten us in so much trouble. So that was James 1.19. Down in verse 26, he goes on. So he says, those who consider themselves religious. Now, I'm not a huge fan of that word. These days, that word religion is kind of misconstrued. It's almost more known as man's attempt to please God. In this verse right here and in other verses, the next verse actually as well, James is just saying religion as relationship with God. And I think by the way that he's speaking, he's also meaning the demonstration of that relationship with God, the the visible part, the actions that you take, not to earn your salvation, but as a result of salvation. So he says, to those who consider themselves religious, having a relationship with God, and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves. Whoa. Whoa. If you're not keeping a tight rein, a a tight grip on your tongue, you're deceiving yourselves of what? Of what, James? What are we deceiving themselves? And their religion is worthless. Wow. That is a really, really big verse. So let's break it down a little bit. What does he mean right there? He means, he says, uh, those who do not keep a tight rein on their tongues... That, that word, a tight rein, means to lead with a bridle. Anybody ever r- ride horses? Yeah, some people ride horses. I've, I've ridden horses a few times. I am certainly not an, an aquarian or a, what's it, equestrian or whatever it is. So I see, see, apparently, I don't even know. So, okay. So, this is a horse. Well, this is a horse's most of his face, okay? And you see that, that bit, that, that metal thing that's in his mouth and the bridle that comes off of it? Am I, am, I, am I right, you horse riders? Okay, I'm just kind of flying by the seat of my pants here. Okay, so you've got this, this little bit, and it's a piece of metal. It's about this big, and, and we'll say it weighs, what, you know, half of a pound? Not really big. But James is saying, that's the thing. You need to keep a tight rein on your tongue because why because if you don't you're deceiving yourself and your religion is worthless and that word worthless it means vain unreal ineffectual unproductive or godless wow so james is saying those who say they are followers of jesus but you just cannot control your tongue. Now again, do, do we all stumble? Absolutely. We're not going to be perfect in the way that Jesus is perfect. We're going to have moments and in and, and anger and, and, and just, just different times and different stresses. Are things going to come out? And yes, it's a struggle all the time. Yes. But James is talking about someone who just really doesn't have any control over their tongue. He says, your religion, that relationship with God that you think that you have, and again, I think James is maybe pointing also to like the action behind it because James is full of, hey, you, 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 you got to, I want to see your faith. He said, worthless, vain, unreal, ineffectual, unproductive, and godless. Those are some really big words to describe your religion, to describe your faith. Very, very negative, and in fact, damning words to describe your religion. And then he says in there, if you don't keep a tight rein on your tongues, you, they deceive themselves. It's you're fooling yourself into thinking your religion has value. You're fooling yourself. If you can't control that one little part of your body, you're fooling yourself. Your religion is in vain. It's worthless. And then, can't pass over this verse, verse 27. Now, he gives us an example. What does good religion look like? Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. And to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. 
So if, if verse 26, if you consider yourself uh, religious and you don't keep a tight rein on your tongue, that's like, you, you, any, anybody box? Anybody ever boxed? I, I haven't boxed. Okay, cool, we got some boxers in here. So, all right, so you're, you're matched up, and, and you, what is that punch called? A jab. Okay, and a, a jab, is a jab to just completely knock somebody out? No. What, what is a jab meant to do? It's meant to kind of stun them. Right? What do you come in after a jab? That right hook, if you're right-handed, I guess. You jab, and then you just come in with the finishing move right there. And I think that's what James is doing here. He's like, okay, you want to know what good, pure, true religion is? Look after orphans and widows and, and do stuff. Let me see your faith. Demonstrate your faith. Again, not to earn your salvation, but as a demonstration of your salvation, and then he says, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Don't be polluted by the world. That's what James is doing. So, I mean, he is just straight up throwing the knockout punch right there, and that's just chapter one. That's why I love the book of James. He is just absolutely straight up. Now, I want to talk about James for a second, because James is an interesting character, the, the book of James, it's, it's towards the end of the Bible. It is so chock full of truth. And as you read it, it's like he doesn't mess around. He doesn't have time to put a bunch of fluffy stuff in there. If you know the book of James, it is just, I mean, you, you hit go and you are at 100 the entire time through the book of James. But here's something interesting that we know about James. James, again, the half-brother of Jesus, did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah pre-resurrection. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty interesting thing, and, and Scripture doesn't talk a whole lot, whole lot about it, but Jesus had brothers and I think a sister, and like he had this family, but they were not bought into this whole Jesus Messiah thing. They were actually a little bit on the opposite side of that. So let, let's read John chapter 7, verse 1. It says, after this, Jesus went around in Galilee. Now, Galilee is the northern part of Israel, and Judea is the southern part of Israel where Jerusalem is. So he says, after this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders were there looking for a way to kill him. So the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were like, this Jesus guy, we have got to get rid of him. Let's find a way to kill him. So Jesus knew that, so he was being careful about traveling down to the south uh, around Jerusalem where the religious leaders were. Verse 2, but when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. So interesting, it says Jesus' brothers, these were his actual relatives, his half-brothers there. It doesn't say James is there, but we're going to assume that James was there. It goes on, verse 4. Uh, these brothers are saying, no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, these miracles, show yourself to the world. Now... At this point, if we stopped right there, we would look at it and go, okay, Jesus' brothers are trying to help him out. They're like, Jesus, you're doing some amazing things. You're doing these miracles. You've got a bunch of people following you. It's going to be the Feast of Tabernacles. There's going to be like, like hundreds of thousands of people down in Jerusalem. Jesus, you should go there and show yourself and show the things that you're doing so more people will follow you. It sounds good, right? Except the little... Verse 5 right here, it says, For even his own brothers did not believe in him. What does that mean? What were they actually doing? They were ridiculing him. They were making fun of Jesus. His brothers were saying, Oh, Jesus, I know they want to kill you there in Jerusalem. Now, I might be embellishing that a little bit, but that's what we get from these verses. And again, James isn't mentioned specifically in here, but I think we can assume this was the heart of James because he did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after 
the resurrection. So maybe the whole reason we took that tangent is as we look through the book of James, and especially chapter 3 that we're going to look at today, maybe, just maybe, James was writing this from this perspective of remembering the fact that he ridiculed the Messiah. The fact that he tried to say, oh yeah, you should go down to, to Jerusalem. Don't worry the fact that they're trying to kill you. You should go down there and show your little parlor tricks that you're doing, Jesus. And maybe James is thinking back of some of the things. And, and chances are, if he said that, he probably said more than that. And I wonder if he was just thinking, man, what, what awful words I allowed to come out of my mouth. I wish I could take them back. And in fact, in James 1 verse 1, he starts out like this. He says, James, a servant of God and of the what? The Lord Jesus Christ. And the word servant, it really means like a bond servant, like completely dedicated and sold out to. James is saying, I am completely dedicated and sold out to not my brother Jesus necessarily, but Jesus Christ the Messiah. Lord means master. Jesus Christ. Christ means Messiah. It's, it's interesting as well to look at the book of James. Paul, when he writes his epistles... He's like, I, Paul, a servant of God, am, am writing to, to you guys this, and I send greetings, and man, I'm always praying for you guys, and like, like, you know, I hope you're doing well, and just thanks so much for your prayers and the gift that you sent. And you know, Paul takes a while to get into it. James starts with this right here, a half of a sentence, and then just, just coming straight, straight in with punches. James, again, I have to look at it like, man, I got to make up for lost time. Like half of my life, I did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And in fact, I ridiculed him and made fun of him. I, I got to make up for some time. And he just comes in and gives it to us straight. So that was chapter one, a little overview. In chapter two, James unravels chapter one. And he kind of writes, what does it look like to care for the poor? What's it look like to not show favoritism? And what does it look like to have a faith that's more than just a bunch of empty words? So that's chapter, three, uh, chapter two. And then in chapter three, it's really interesting. He goes back to the analogy that he made in chapter one. That first verse uh, that we read about the, the bridal, verse 26. So it says this, verse one, or chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Those who consider themselves religious and do not, uh, yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. So we can see James going back and reflecting on that verse, and now chapter 3, he is going to unpack what that means. So as, as we read through this, we can make a couple of assumptions from James writing. And these are the important things as we're reading scripture. I always like to pause and give you some examples about, hey, how do I understand scripture better? How do I understand what the writer is trying to say here? Well, if you hear these now and then go back and read through James, and, and in fact, these first three chapters, you'll go, oh, I see that's exactly what he's doing. So two assumptions. Number one, there were some people that were talking the talk but not walking the walk. There were some people that thought they were super Christians, but there was no action, no demonstration to back that up. I heard a youth pastor many, many, many years ago, he said, your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Everybody get that? I'll give it to you one more time. Your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk, the actions, talk louder than your talk talks. And I think that's what James was getting at, like, like come on guys, I'm, I'm hearing a bunch of words and they're good Christianese words, but there's not a lot of action there. So that was the first thing 
that we can assume. The second thing, there were some people talking and they were tearing apart the church. Because some of the words that he uses in here, James is like, you got to stop this. You can't keep talking. You're tearing apart the church. What you're saying is no good. You're calling yourself a Christian, but you're acting and talking like this. It's not matching up, and you're actually doing damage. And James is genuinely concerned about this. So chapter 3, he goes all in on the power of the tongue. So here we go. Four warnings about the tongue. We're just going to get two of them today. Number one, the tongue demonstrates power. The tongue demonstrates power. I'll give you one very simple example. Think of a career. Think of a job. Okay? You could be the smartest, most qualified most educated, most degreed person out there. You could have a whole lot of experience. You could have everything, the whole pedigree, all of that. But if you can't control your tongue, guess what? No one is going to want to work with you. And if, and if it's so visible that like you go to interview for a new job and, and you, your resume is, you know, has more words and stuff in it than the Bible does and you're like, I got this in the bag. But the words that come out of your mouth, just the way you talk, the attitude that you portray, the snideness or the arrogance in your voice... What's going to happen? Are you going to get that job? Probably not. Depends on how desperate they are, I guess. But probably not. Um, I can tell you, I have done a lot over the past almost five years, a lot of interviewing, and I can read a resume like the Matrix, okay? I have looked through literally thousands of resumes, that is a huge part of my job is just trying to hire staff. And uh, the key, listen, guys, the keys are weird, okay? We love the keys, but the keys are weird. It's really challenging to bring people. So I have to be really careful as I'm looking at resumes. And, and, and I really look for three things, character, chemistry, and competency. In that order. We'll come back to character. Chemistry, do they get along with people around them? That's very, very important. Competency, yes, I want to hire somebody competent, but we can teach people to do things and all that. But character, that's where that tongue falls in. I want to know that somebody has integrity. That somebody, when they say something, it, it is intentional. That's what they mean. Say what you mean, mean what you say. It's a huge, huge, huge statement in my house. But I want to know that that person has character, that the words that are coming out of their mouth are true. And they're edifying. And they're uplifting. And, and, and they show integrity. So the tongue, it demonstrates this power greater than a resume, greater than your experience or whatever it is. The tongue is so, so, so powerful and it can supersede all of those things. Remember Luke 6.45, the second half, it says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Whatever is down in your heart, it's going to come out. And that's a very easy way to see what a person is all about. So chapter 3, verse 1. James gives us a couple of verses here, and he's kind of sliding right into this thing about the tongue. He says, in verse 1, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now pause, that verse scares me, because teaching's kind of my job. So just to let you know, in case you're wondering, I take this very, very seriously. I put, I won't say too much time into message prep, but man, I work hard at this because this verse is scary. And, and again, say what you mean, mean what you say, know your faith. Because guess what? I hate to break it to you, but as followers of Jesus, we are supposed to be outside of those doors right there, sharing our faith, 
call it teaching, call it whatever, we're supposed to be demonstrating and sharing our faith. So, verse 2 says, we all stumble in many ways. So James is like, hey, listen, I'm not expecting anybody to be perfect. So we all, we all trip up and mess up in a lot of different ways. And then he says, anyone who was never at fault in what they say is perfect. And he doesn't mean a, like perfect sinless. He just means complete. He's doing all right. Is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. So wait a minute, no, 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 you speak with your tongue, and James is saying, no, 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 if you can have control of your tongue, you can have control of your entire body. So number one, the tongue demonstrates power. The second warning about the tongue is the tongue determines direction. Kind of going off on this theme of the letter D here. The tongue determines direction. Verse 3, now here's where he goes back to that analogy in chapter 1, verse 26. He says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Now again, how, how big did we say that bit was? That little thing, maybe half of a pound, eight ounces maybe, okay? We'll just, we'll just say it that for even numbers. Anybody know the average size of a horse? The average horse is five feet tall and a thousand pounds. It's a pretty massive beast, okay? I mean, you know, horse riding looks fun, and, and if you're not really a horse rider, until you get up onto that horse and you're like, I am way high up off the ground, and this will hurt if I fall. Horses are big animals, and James is going back to his analogy, and he says, when we put those bits in the mouths of the horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, a thousand pound, five foot tall beast, by this little one half pound thing. And we steer it all around. Wherever you pull that bridle, that's exactly where that horse is going to go. Unless you get a stubborn horse like Nikki got one year when we went to student life camp or to camp up in North Carolina. Horse wasn't doing anything, but that's a whole different story. But see, here's the thing. How does that bit actually control the horse? I'll, I'll ask it this way. Who controls the bit? We do. The rider. With this, with this little one half pound thing, we can steer this thousand pound horse. And James is saying the exact same thing is true with your tongue. Your tongue will determine the direction in which you go. So James, so good as he is, he's like, okay, maybe you're not really a horse person, okay? Maybe you're scared to death of horses and you haven't ever ridden a horse, I'll give you another analogy, verse 4. This one's really good for us because we like water, we like boats, and maybe we'll get this one, okay? We don't have a lot of horses down here. He says, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. The tongue determines direction, not anything else. Now, okay, most of us probably know what a rudder is, so just for fun, let's look at a picture of a rudder. Okay, so I know the picture is a little pixely, but you see the propeller, you see the blue lift, and you see the guy in the white suit that's standing by the lift? Okay, so that's a, that's a human. Now, compared to the guy, the rudder's pretty big, all right? So it's, it's a lot bigger than he is. But that's just the small back portion of the ship. See how small that rudder is compared to the rest of the ship? Go ahead to the next picture. Okay, so here's four different ships here. We've got the, the Tirpitz, it's 251 meters. The Yamato, 263 meters. The USS Enterprise, which is an aircraft carrier, okay, 342 meters. And then we have this Nock Nevis 
ship. 458 meters. Quick math. 13, 1400 feet long. I can see your wheel spinning, Gabe. So, so we'll, we'll call it 1350, just, just for math right there. 1,350 feet long or so. Look at how small that rudder is. Something that tiny can steer something that big. Now, I've got one more picture. I really want to show you how big this ship is. Go ahead. Okay, you've got a cruise ship. Okay, you've got the Titanic up there. Then you've got the Eiffel Tower. Okay, we've got uh, another aircraft carrier, another cruise ship. And then we have, what building is that? The Empire State Building. This ship is bigger than the Empire State Building. And it is completely steered, comparatively, by a very, very small rudder. And that's the point that I want you guys to get. I don't have this massive application, do these three things and your life will be perfect. I don't have that today. What I want us all to understand is the power of the tongue. It demonstrates power. It determines direction. And if we don't get control of it, really bad things that happen. And again, we could go around this room and we could all tell stories about life that how our tongues have gotten us in so much trouble. So my challenge is to you this week, before we come back here in two weeks and we really, really dig into this, I really want us to do a deep dive into our hearts. Ask God, hey God, do I have a problem with my tongue? Maybe you're not lashing out in anger. Maybe you don't have a problem with cursing, or, but maybe you have a problem with gossip. Maybe you have a problem with just sharing information all of the time. Maybe you're that person that just can't wait to get your story out. Why? Because there's just something broken inside of you, but your story is way more important. I don't know where you fall on this, but I want us all to say, hey, God, do I have a problem with my tongue? And the more important part than that, listen. Stop talking and listen. Because I promise you, God will reveal to you if there's something that he wants you to work on. And I want you to pray this week, God, would you help me get control of my tongue? Here's our key statement here. Tame your tongue or inhibit what's important. Let's pray. God, we come before you humbled, God, that we know that we all mess up in this area. God, I ask that you would help us to get control of our tongues. God, help us to not just be careful of the things that we say because we don't want to inhibit what's important. Not just build a better filter so that things don't come out. But God, would you help us dig down deep inside of our hearts to figure out what is wrong with us, to figure out what is lacking, to figure out what's the problem and the trouble in there. And God, to ultimately give that to you. God, thank you that you forgive. And as many times as we have messed up in this area, God, you continue to forgive us. Thank you for that. God, thank you that you are a good father. And God, I know today might be difficult for some people who have lost their fathers or who just never had one, or maybe even worse, had a bad one. 
God, I know that today can be tough. And again, God, I thank you that you are a heavenly father that we can always count on. That will never turn his back on us. No matter what life or the enemy throws at us, God, that you are there. That you tell us, God, we can speak to the mountains. It's time that they move because you are bigger, better, stronger, and greater than anything else that the enemy can throw at us. And God, I pray for those this morning who are here in person or attending online who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who do not have a relationship with you. Maybe they believe some things about God. Maybe they were raised in a religion that it's about doing a bunch of things. God, right now in this moment, for those who do not know you as their Savior, God, would you just touch their hearts? Speak to them in this moment, Lord. And if that's you this morning who you may say, I, don't, I, I just don't know if I have this relationship that you talk about. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Would you just say, Lord Jesus, I trust you as my Savior. I trust that you died on the cross to pay for my sin rose again three days later, proving your power over death, over hell, and over the grave. God, I give you my life. Lord, save me, and Lord, change me. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, you said that and you got your relationship right with Jesus for the first time. I would love to know about it. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to make any commotion, but I would just love to be able to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, I got it right today. I started a relationship with Jesus today. Thank you. Thank you. Today is the day that I decided to give and live my life for Jesus. God, we thank you that you are bigger, better, stronger, and greater than anything that's out there. Thank you, God, that we know we have a heavenly Father that never leaves us. God, give us strength and give us courage to do life in the way that you would have us. And God, we pray for this time of offering. Would you use it in an awesome way, Lord? Help us to be generous people, generous to this community and generous to this whole world, God, so that they would see your love through us. We pray all of this in the awesome, amazing name of Jesus. Amen.